Hello and welcome to part four of Dumpster Linux. Now, if you've actually made it this far, I'm hoping that you've realized something at the end of part three, which is provided I've actually got the installation media and armed with my uh, basic knowledge of the hardware and of the BIOS configuration, I could basically have had that machine up and running to a basic situation in about 15 minutes. That is a few minutes to uh, go through the BIOS and uh, make sure everything's happy and then, you know, install the base operating system. You saw how well um, it went on. Six minutes once it was up and running and I'd answered the questions. But rather than me reinventing the wheel and showing you what Unity has to offer, I'm going to put links numbers one and two in the hoo-ha bar. There's going to be another couple of links going in there as well, but link number one is to a half hour video from Alan Pope. And he's taking on what I consider to be quite a good tour of what Unity has to offer. Now, Nixie Pixel uh, delivers things in short bursts and um, she's putting forward the top five things to do after you've installed Linux. Now, one or two of the things that Nixie is talking about may not ring true with you. You may not know what Ubuntu One is or other bits like that. Um, but fear not, we will address them. So um, <clears throat> why don't you go off and have a look at those videos? Don't worry about me. I'm here with a cup of tea and uh, come back here when you're finished and we'll carry on. Have they gone yet? Yeah? Next part. Can you tell what it is yet? Tommy kangaroo down sport. Tommy kangaroo down shag a wallaby. I think I've used the wrong colours, but bugger it anyway. People will know what I'm talking about, I hope. Uh, bum 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 bum. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, where's my favourite? I never could spell this. And that's one of the things that's always confused me. As a dyslexic, I've always managed to spell dyslexia. Hmm. Anyway. Let's try oh, a bit of blue around there. Chirpy, chirpy, cheap, cheap, chirpy, chirpy, cheap, cheap, chirp. Yeah, da -da. Ooh, I think that about covers it. Right, we're done. <sighs> Why didn't you tell me they were back? I rely on you. To... <clears throat> uh, welcome back. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, hopefully, um, <laughs> Um, you've watched what uh, Mr. Pope has had to say and um, about the Unity interface and particularly the dash and the different lenses and the filters on the lens. Um, this is one of the major turnoffs for me about um, Ubuntu and the Unity interface and doing everything through the dash. Uh, primarily they're relying on indexing systems and that's one of the things that I particularly hate. They haven't done them very well. Let's take for example this. <clears throat> what I'm simulating here is a folder that represents uh, this piece of music, for example. This is one of my favourite records. Alan Morehouse and his Bond Street Brigade. Don't rush out and buy it because you can't. <laughs> it's final and they haven't translated that one yet. And a number of tracks in there that I've basically converted this album. I've had to digitise the bleeding thing. Um, this is one of the songs, Drum Diddly. Now, um, <laughs> the, if you remember, by looking at the lenses and the various filters, um, you could look, for example, for music and you could filter it by genre. But 
it relies on the indexing system being able to pick up that information. It also relies on um, you being able to feed the indexing system what it needs. Let's take a few examples here. How about this? If I'm looking for Alan Morehouse in his Bond Street Brigade, what about this ampersand? What if I type the word AND in instead? Would that cause the indexing system to miss it? And what about the file? Like, um, not all my files are kept uh, or translated to, w, uh, to MP3s or OG files. Um, a number of them are kept as WAV files. Because with MP3 files and some of the others, um, they rely on a piece of information in here that's actually contained within the music file. And that contains some of the information like uh, genre, music style, all the rest of it. But some of my audio is kept as WAV files. And the WAV file has got no ability to contain this. Not only that, but what if I was lazy in the early days and didn't put a lot of that information in? Indeed, any of it. The information isn't there for the indexing system to pick up on. So if I'm looking for some easy listening uh, by Alan Morehouse and his Bond Street Brigade, what's the odds on that the dash will completely miss it because it's not in the indexing system? Or rather, something else is in the indexing system. It's not going to work. Files that are not defined properly, as far as the indexing system is concerned, are just going to fall off the end. It's either not going to be able to index them uh, or it will index them badly. And then you're going to have problems. And that's one of the main reasons why I don't like the dash, I don't like the lenses, and I don't like the filters. It's, you know, over the years, various filing systems and database systems have come and gone, and I've had no luck with any of them. <laughs> it's been more efficient for me, and, you know, to have a proper filing structure, a proper folder structure, and just do a file search. Because at the end of the day, one of the other things that these indexing systems are doing is they're chewing up processor time. They're also chewing up your hard disk in keeping a database. Exactly how big the database will wind up being depends on how much data they're slipping from the files. Just imagine um, uh, if the indexing system, for example, was to uh, keep a track of the words and phrases in a document. Uh, <laughs> so that you can search for documents which have certain words inside them. Jeepers, you might as well just throw away the originals and rely on the indexing database. That'll be as good as damn it got the document in there. And there are other questions. What happens when you hook up a two terabyte drive? You know, via USB, is the indexing system going to index that? Are you going to have to wait around five or six hours before you can use the dash on it while it indexes it? And what are you going to do in the meantime? Because your process is going to be chewed up doing the indexing. And with Windows systems, for example, Windows XP, um, I think Microsoft tried to do something like this. And there was a, a period where they were putting a Windows search bar down in the bottom right near the clock. Um, oh boy, I don't know how many people uninstalled that beauty. <laughs> they didn't even ask for it. It just came down with an update. And the Windows indexing system was also put in. I mean, if I don't think that someone's going to use it and I'm installing Windows for them, I'll open up my computer, right click on the C drive, go down to properties. In somewhere in there is going to be the section which says allow uh, indexing service to index this drive. I untick that, apply it and let Windows do its thing to strip out the indexing flags. Because indexing, I mean, how many times do you actually search your hard drive for information. Most of the time you know where it is. You just click on my documents and it's either in pictures, music, documents, yada yada. You pretty much know where the document is. Not many of us will actually search our drives for things. So why on earth have we got these tools in our systems that are just chewing up processor time, chewing up hard disk space? For what? You know? For an inaccurate index system that's got holes because of historical data. And most of us are in a rush anyway. How many of us are actually going to put the details in documents that are actually needed for the indexing system to work properly? My argument? Not many, and certainly not me. I haven't got the time to go through decades worth of documents 
and converting them to a system in which the indexing system can properly uh, interrogate and put the information in there deliberately so the index can pull it out so I can go search for something that I know is there in the first place anyway. So to me, Unity made absolutely no sense at all. And also, one of the other things that's uh, kicked off, and Mark Shuttleworth has uh, dropped himself in it on this, particularly with some of the language he's been using. Um, they're actually in, unit in Ubuntu 12.10 or something like that. The key home search in the dash, the home lens, is actually going to be tied into Amazon searches. So whenever you're actually searching for something, it'll bring back things from Amazon. Now, it's a bit more complicated than I'm making it out to be. But, you know, <laughs> for an operating system that is based around putting things in there, okay, you can drop your common uh, applications in the sidebar, etc, etc, yada, yada. But for something which is uh, so focused on the dash, to be pushing everything out to get searches from Amazon? Ah, uh, I mean, as various people have said in the discussions, some people uh, can't use Amazon because it's not in their part of the world. And for all sorts of other reasons, um, for, uh, for it to go to the grief of a machine going out to, um, you know, if there's one thing that Shuttleworth has said is that the searches won't go directly to Amazon. They'll go via a canonical servers which will anonymize them and then bring the results back from Amazon. But, you know, Amazon isn't the cheapest in many things. You know, people like to shop around. And one of the points that I made, um, which uh, haven't been answered at the minute, is that, you know, people, some people are on mobile communications. You know, and these searches, every time you use the dash, you know, you're chewing up people's bandwidth. Not everyone is on the kind of bandwidth and internet connections that can handle that kind of thing. I mean, all you can eat uh, data plans pretty much went out in the UK on the domestic broadband some time ago. Now they're all you can eat within limits. <laughs> and, uh, you know, more and more I'm hitting uh, my bandwidth allowances. Uh, it's not good. It's not good. And for Ubuntu basically to be adding to those woes, oish, it's not good at all. So uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, boot that machine into uh, the standard installation that we've put on and I'll show you what's there. Uh, basically what you've got in the standard installation. Uh, it's missing a few things. You know, there's a few things balanced and we'll see what's there. Uh, before we hook it up to the internet and uh, hmm, you can get a bit of a feel for it. Okay, because I mucked up an earlier video, I'm going to have to ask you to make believe that this is the same installation that you saw before. In fact, it is, but I've done a few things to it. Now, if you're used to installing Windows, you're probably thinking, hang on a minute, this has already got the sound drivers installed, the video drivers installed, the network drivers installed, and yes, the standard image normally carries uh, a good deal of drivers for the more common hardware. So unless you're dealing with something that's uh, quite a bit off the beaten track, the drivers should be on the CD already for you. Indeed, the installation actually does uh, a very neat trick, I think, which is that if it detects that there's a wireless card in the machine when you're installing it, it will ask if you want to use a wireless network in order to get the updated drivers and extra software, which we didn't install when we installed it. Uh, quite neat, I reckon. Now, if you plan on doing um, any number of installs, you probably want one of these, a USB memory stick. And on this, you can keep various text files and other things. Now, I'm going to install this, and uh, you'll see down on the left-hand side that the icon pops up for it, it mounts it and brings you the contents. And on it, I've got a nice little text file, setup.txt, that's just what I've called it. And in here is a command. Now, <laughs> before I do this, uh, link number three in the hoo-ha bar is going to be towards a printable version of this, the keyboard shortcuts. You saw it in uh, Alan Pope's video. And uh, link number three is to that. But link number four isn't actually a link. It's this command, and you can copy that and put it in a text file. Um, once you've got it in the text file, you can obviously put it, like I have, 
in the new installation. Once you go to the dash, you can then ask for a terminal. Once you've got a terminal, you can then right click and select paste. And what'll happen is it'll paste that command in there. Now normally these buttons would be on the left hand side by default, but this command puts them on the right. A very nice little thing to do if you're used to Windows and having your, button, your control buttons on the right. So that does that. Right, let's have a look at the uh, default installations, uh, what we've got in here. So we'll, uh, we'll go to the dash, we'll go to the lens for the applications, and we'll um, expand on the installed. I'll just clear that, and we'll see all the installed results. Now, ignore Alien Arena, we'll come back to that. <laughs> uh, but you can see, I'll bring your attention to this additional drivers icon. And if you've got anything like an ATI graphics card or uh, an NVIDIA graphics card, you'll typically see that icon up in the um, bar and it'll say, there's additional drivers that are restricted that are available to you if you want them. Do you want to go get them? And that will download the drivers for your graphics card. It might also work for various sound cards. I haven't had anything with those kind of drivers on yet. But you can see we've got the usual suspects, um, a disk burner to burn CDs, archiving. Um, we have actually have a document viewer here, so you can view PDF documents straight out of the, uh, straight out of the box. Um, usage analyzers for your disk drive, uh, Gwibber, the social client, which is integrated into the uh, main control at the top right. We have LibreOffice. Now, if you're... <sighs> Many people don't seem to want to bother with LibreOffice because they're unsure of it. But, I mean, the thing I suggest to people, especially if they're on Windows, is say, look, this thing is free. Go get it, down, uh, download it, install it, see if you get on with it, see if it works for you as a, an Office client. If it does, great, you've saved yourself a bit of money in, in buying Microsoft Office. If it doesn't, you can just deinstall it and go and buy Microsoft Office. What have you got to lose? Nothing. What have you, a bit of time, a few days maybe. Um, what have you got to uh, gain? <laughs> you, you can save whatever uh, Office is costing these days. Because if you do go for the cheaper versions of Office, typically some bits are missing. Like uh, Impress is the version of uh, PowerPoint, for example, for presentations. That would be missing. Um, so, yeah, it, it's worth looking into LibreOffice. I prefer, personally, LibreOffice over OpenOffice. But um, one of the things that these are doing is that they're using open document standards. Like if you've been in IT for a while, you'll know, you'll have the experience of having had old uh, word processing documents that aren't readable by the newer software. And this, um, if you, you know, the, the Open Document Foundation is one way to going forward and solving all this by having open document standards so that things are readable when you go into the future. You've got the usual, you've got a movie player, etc, etc, Mines, <laughs> a very common game. Um, you've also got uh, rhythm box, music player, you've got various printing, scanning facil facilities. Um, shot, well, Startup Disk Creator. Now the Startup Disk Creator is very useful because you could use this, if you've already got a Linux machine running, to put an ISO file actually um, on a memory stick. You can see the memory stick there. Um, that's that could do with a bit of extra height, but I could actually select an ISO file in the top, select the USB down, erase the disk, and put the ISO image instead of on a CD. I can put it on a memory stick. Bingo! Right, let's get back to this dash. <laughs> Where were we? We were nearly down the bottom. Um, right, update manager. Now. <laughs> The update manager will allow you to get bits and pieces for updates. It will normally appear, and you can see it in the left here. Uh, one thing I'll do by the minute, by the way, is eject this uh, disk system. We're finished with that. We're finished with the USB drive, so that goes. In this case, it's up to date because I've already done it. But it would list the updates, and you could just click on Install Updates, and it would go get them for you. Um, so you know you can control. It's it's like Windows more or less. Um, with its uh, software update manager. You just call it up when you want, go and get your updates, bingo! And it will update the system for you. But the other thing that you're going to need to do um, is 
by going to the applications lens is also search for the extras. If you type in the word extras in the dash, you'll find the Ubuntu restricted extras. And this package is what delivers some of the extra codecs and things that you need for the media. Now, haha, what will come up is, I've already installed this, but as it says, it installs the commonly used applications with restricted copyright, MP3, AVI, MPEG, TrueType, Java, Flash, and various other codecs. It's already installed, and this would actually give me the ability to remove it if I wanted to remove it. Um, I'm not sure how far off the right you can see there. But one important thing is this package will not install libdvdcss2. Without that, you can't play encrypted DVDs on a Linux system, so you're going to have to find libdvdcss2 somewhere. There is a URL which you would need to go to in order for to play DVDs, and it shows you the URL there. Um, so, that's how you use the Ubuntu software to get hold of the restricted X extras. That will only, should only take you about two minutes on a reasonable internet connection. Um, and that is a reasonable ADSL connection, by the way. Um, the other thing that I've installed is the Synaptic Package Manager. And we're going to go and get that. Uh, Synaptic. Now, the first time you might find that this isn't installed. And the first thing is asking us for uh, permission. So we're going to give it permission. And here it goes. And what you'll see is that it has a number of uh, abilities. Think of software on um, Ubuntu as like a library for books, but for applications. Instead of a library of books, we have a repository of packages. And everything pretty much comes in its own package. For example, if I wanted to install Chrome, I just type Chrome up here and it comes with the various applications. So, ah, there we go. So we can scroll through. There's what I want, the Chromium browser. So I can right click it. Uh, if I left click it, it'll give me instruction in information. Oh yes, that's definitely what I want. So I can right click it and I can mark it for installation. You've also got various other things. You could do the reverse. If it was installed, I could say mark for removal, which is that option or mark for complete removal, which means it'll get rid of the installation files as well. Um, so you, that is how you can typically find a package and install it and get rid of it. Um, you also have, I'm just going to clear this search here, you also have sections on the left, so if you're not sure what you want, you can look through things. Development, documentation, email, editors, education, embedded drive devices, fonts, GNOME desktop environment, and here we are, games and amusement, the multiverse. Now you'll see I've already installed Alien Arena <laughs> um, because I'm going to show you that running. Um, you know, you have all sorts of different categories so you can browse what's in there and you can click on them for what the information. So the Synaptic Package Manager is typically what you want. Just go to the dash, go to the application lens and ask for Synaptic up there. Now you'll probably have to install it first. Why do I use Synaptic as opposed to the uh, more usual uh, software center, the Ubuntu software that's there? Well, typically I find it better. I've had a few run-ins with the Ubuntu software center over the years and I'm a little bit shy. They've probably improved it by now, but there you go. <laughs> Before we start up Alien Arena, I'm going to show you the home folder, which you have seen already when I installed, uh, inserted the um, USB stick down here. And you can see you've got most of the common locations, just as you would have under a Windows machine. You've also got this examples folder, and you can use this to test that things are running. Because you have an audio showcase in an OG format, and you have a video showcase in an OG format. So we're just going to open this with the movie player. That works. So we can just close that down. Now, um, 
The other thing that I installed was Alien Arena, that took a few minutes, so we're just going to run that up. Um, we're going to go into Applications, again, for Alien. Um, and there runs Alien Arena. I'm just going to uh, bring you in on it a little closer. Now I think that uh, I'm not going to uh, start anything serious off. I'm just going to give you a brief rundown and show you what it can do. Um, I'm not sure about the brightness settings on this. Um, I'm just going to force the brightness up a little because the exposure on this might not be the best. Right, that's plus a little. So we'll see what happens. I'm going to go into single player. Now bear in mind that what we're playing on this on now is about a three to four year old machine. There's no special graphics card in here. Uh, we're, we're not dealing with any uh, weird graphics drivers. This is actually going to be doing this off the software capabilities of the onboard hardware. Um, easy. Awaiting connection. Now I'm hoping there's not going to be anything in here that's about to kill me. <laughs> but um, we'll soon find out it's loading the game and I'm trying to also keep uh, an eye on what you can see but um, right um, this is not easy my hair is getting in the way I'm actually going to up the uh, up that uh, am I the only person in here yes I think I am right so now that we've got a bit of time to do this um, what did I want to do uh, focus Two, one, boom. Whoops. What fired? Was it me? I, I hope I'm the only thing in here. Uh, there's other sections down there. We'll find out. As you can see, this is a 3D um, battle game. Uh, if you've seen something like uh, Quake, you'd have seen this before because I think this is actually built on the Quake 2 engine if you know what that is so you'll know that uh, for something like this with no 3D card installed it's not doing too bad and I'm hoping that you can actually see the colors can you see everything okay I'm just going to up the brightness a little manual exposure right bingo hopefully you should now be able to see uh, that we are in a nice rich 3D environment. Um, we're running smoothly. We have all the health that we need. Oh, more armor. And that's not bad. For a dumpster machine, which is roughly three years old. Oh, I think that was acid. <laughs> we need some health. Um, yeah. Let's try and blow something up. Is that a rocket launcher? I think it is. No, it may not be. Whatever it is, it's... Uh, hmm. Ah, that's the rocket launcher. But we're not blowing that up. It's not too bad. So there we are, we're able to play games on a dumpster machine in reasonable 3D, uh, have a bit of fun without um, too much grief. Um, it's free, we just downloaded it from the central repository. And there you go, I'm just going to come out of the game. Um, we came down to 5 ammo for that, let's just quit that and get out of it. Whoops, didn't mean to be in there, quit game, are we sure? Yes. But there we go. So what you've taken away from this is that we've got this machine up and running in about 10 minutes. Um, if you keep some critical things on the USB stick, it will make your job of uh, installing things a lot easier. Indeed, you're going to have a link number five, which is going to be um, Linux Crusade. Now, link number five is going to be to uh, my installation code part one, which m should help you get going. Well, I can actually get to it, that is. <laughs> there you go. And what you'll find in here is various pieces of code that I use and I keep on my, uh, my memory stick. I'm just going to get this and sort it out again. And there we go. Just lock the focus. And here we go. Now, boom, boom. as you can see, these are commands which you can just copy and type in like we did before. 
um, for example this one and this one will uh, remove various packages so we have the command sudo which means treat us as root and give us the maximum permissions apt get which means we're dealing with the application system remove and then a list of applications that I want to remove and uh, this one for example is used to ensure that the overlay scroll bars get killed you know all we've got to do is basically right click copy get a terminal uh, like you saw before the black screen the terminal right click and paste it in and press return now the other things are things like this like <laughs> and this really does make life easy rather than sit in synaptic package manager typing in uh, an application name then right clicking to install then sitting back typing in the next application and getting that to install you can do something like this instead this is a simple command that is sudo give us root permissions apt hyphen get which says we're dealing with the application uh, install uh, and then a whole load of applications to install uh, to add into the system so we can just copy that whole command uh, copy that we can just go into a terminal and we can ask the applications uh, for a terminal there it is and we can just right click paste it in enter the command it says uh, who are you I need your password um, it works to roll out uh, this is going to take some extra space. Do we want to continue? Yes. Boom. And there it goes. And it's going to install all those applications for us. So we can come back in about 10 or 15 minutes. And this should be, oh, about 11 minutes, 29, 28 seconds. Uh, come back in 10 to 15 minutes. And all these applications which I want installed on the system should all be installed for me. Now, you can take those, put them on your text file on your USB stick, and just copy them and paste them. And that makes installing all these applications a lot easier than they would be otherwise. So <laughs> there you go. Um, I'll just return you to here. Um, we've got some various things. I don't like evolution, for example. I don't like transmission. I don't like um, uh, f-spots or that sort of stuff. So I, I tell the system to get rid of that. Um, I use that to install, ensure the overlay scroll bars are killed. I could if I wanted to put in that other one which moves the buttons to the right, but <laughs> I don't use Unity myself. We're going to see um, Lubuntu uh, in, a sh in a video coming up shortly. Then I installed this branch of applications. You don't have to install this particular lot unless you're a particular fan of Zine as a media player. I am, so I install them, <laughs> but you don't have to. If you want to use the ZF system, ZFS file system, that'll get that installed for you. And if you want to use Handbrake um, to rip your DVDs to media files so you can take them portable, because I have to admit, all my DVDs now just sit in a, sit in a cupboard and I just play the files. Um, this will typically get, get you running. If that doesn't work, um, then this works. <laughs> And I typically, these days, I go for that one immediately, rather than going for the other one. Um, so, um, that's ClipGrab for YouTube video downloading. You might want to give ClipGrab a miss, or look up the latest installation candidate on their website. Um, because <laughs> I've been having some problems with it, and I've been using another package called YouTube Downloader. But, uh, or YouTube-DL, or something like that. Kdn Live is a very, uh, that's what I'm using these days as a video editing suite. So uh, that's one uh, to watch for. Um, I used to use, uh, used to use Senalera and indeed part two, uh, that's where part two of this thing might actually, of my installation code might actually be out of whack because I have kept this up to date, but I haven't kept the explanations up to date. Um, so there you go, KDN Live. You'll want to put these in one line at a time, uh, by the way. That's one line. Put that in, let it settle, enter that line, let it settle, and then install the application. And then you'll be done. It's, it's really that simple. You just highlight everything, right-click, copy, go to a terminal, paste it, and away you go. Um, how are we doing? Uh, 8 minutes, 23 seconds, and we're on a standard home DSL line. So, there you go. Uh, see you in the next video.